So you bought a piece of land and you've started clearing it or you're thinking about clearing it. Let's talk a little bit about some of the the most basic things you can do with that land to start enhancing your lifestyle, to start getting some use out of the land, and to increase its value. Now, in past videos, we've talked about trail clearing, creating trails to access the land better, mapping out its water sources or potential water sources. We've talked about the things that are in our general permaculture design. We've also talked about the importance of getting to know the land a little bit. So I want to focus on that. What is the minimalist type of thing you can do on your piece of land to start getting familiar with it? I'm Justin Hit with Prosperity Homestead. Very often when we buy a piece of land, we're already living someplace else. Okay, so you're living in the city right now and you bought a piece of land in the county and you want to move out in the county and you're dreaming about your homestead and your animals and the chickens and the on the uh, compost and the giant garden you have and all these things are going to happen in the future. Now this very often is depressing. I'll tell you right up front, when you dream about something and don't take action, you'll have this inherent frustration and that's what we we come in here to try to help you solve for. So we're going to talk about, again, the minimal thing you can do on your land. And again, if you have access to the land, if you can put a backpack on and walk out on the land, you can start at least camping on that land. But before we even get there, what is it that you want from your land? Do you mountain bike? Do you hike? Do you like camping? Do you like to garden? A gentleman I used to know, uh, he's passed away since now, was a property developer and he would buy rural land near cities and he would very often partner with a farmer so he wasn't going and buying the farm and building a bunch of houses because it's not feasible to build houses until you have demand and so he would buy the land next to a farmer and he'd knock on the door of the farmer and he'd say to the farmer hey i just bought the land next door it's 70 80 acres i'd like to form a partnership with you to go farm that land very often the farmers loved it because the farmers could pay a very low rate for access to the land. That rate is very often in the, in the labor that they were using to maintain that land. They could extend their crop and then there was some kind of small percentage on the back end when it came to the sale of any products from that land. Uh, because the concept is, is that we're growing something on that land and if you sell it, then we need to get some proceeds. But if you're just using it internally, like so for example, uh, growing hay on the fields and keeping those fields up and then feeding those hay to your animals, there was no commission on that. But if you sold the hay, there was a commission on that. Um, but usually it worked out really well. He'd get fresh meats from the farmers. Very often the farmer could extend their range when they had uh, cattle, for example. Uh, and it was a great deal. But one of the things that he did is, is he found a piece of land and he set it up as a family resort or a family retreat. So again, he got the trails in place. Uh, it, some of this was farmland, so he maintained the fences, he maintained the access points, he maintained the water, and then eventually built a few cabins on site. And those cabins gave his family the ability to go and and you know, camp out and and a very comfortable environment. Now he started out in the beginning with tents, but he eventually would find land near his home and he would partner with the farmer and the farmer would put a giant market garden on the land. So these weren't always big farmers, by the way. And so there's this one farm, the a gentleman was having trouble getting land, lived within walking distance of this piece of property that this developer just bought. And he was able to uh, lease it off of the developer in exchange for building a giant deer fence and setting up a market garden and basically paid in vegetables. So this developer wasn't look, was looking to hold land. He wasn't looking to, to turn it into housing until he was sure he had demand for the housing. And then even then he would put in a few large uh, upper, upper end houses rather than uh, cutting the land up altogether. My point being is when you acquire your land, don't make the mistake of just clearing off your land. We have to start with a plan. That plan starts with what you want from that land, both your long-term dream and desire, which is to have a homestead or a small farm, and the short-term enhancements to your lifestyle. So I have a plan out in front of me right here to put a campsite. So you guys have seen my video uh, for the platform that we were putting together for the container barn. 
So we're going to put animals on land. I need a secure place to lock up feed and to lock up other things, keep mice out of it, keep you know guests out of it. And so right next to that piece of land, there's going to be a primitive campsite. Now I'm playing around with the, the, the potential for a video series where we go nomadic on this piece of land and, and follow the goats around the land with tents or kind of a small bivouac. Uh, that's an idea that we're, that has come across the plate. Another idea is to do a documentary on just starting a small farm. But this idea in particular is very easy to implement because all it requires is access to some clearing in the woods. So if you've got a piece of property with a clearing, uh, that clearing can then become a camp. So let's talk a little bit about the layout. If you're going to set up a camp, you need two key important things uh, that are likely to be stationary at the camp. Number one is going to be your kitchen site. And number two is going to be your sanitation. Okay, so these things don't have to be fancy. You can take a, a shed or a container or you can just make a small little pole building or a pavilion. And you can have the the, the bathroom and, and water on one side. And on the other side, you can have a, a small kitchen fire such as that. Think about national parks. That's probably the minimal uh, input, which would be a pavilion with a wood fire stove on one side and water. And then a on the other side, dry toilets and water. And then in the middle, it's just open. And the, and the value of this is that it doesn't cost much to get started. It provides shelter from storms. Now you can go high end and have, you know, stonework and, you know, timber frame, or you can go entry level, which would be a carport or a canopy that you hiked in and set up yourself. If you're going to hike in larger pieces of equipment and set them up yourself, you want to have secure storage on site. Uh, because if you're putting up a, you know, a 25 foot by 16 foot uh, kitchen tent and on one side of it you've got the propane hot water heater for your shower and you've got a composting toilet and on the other side you have you know propane stoves and, and cook gear it would just be nicer to be able to take that stuff down and lock it in a shed or lock it in a container uh, so that you can uh, hike out the smaller items which is your tents now when it comes to tents you can take what you can hike in you could build cabins or you can use wall tents See, it's all about getting started. So absolute basic is access so you can hike in, set up a tent, set up a primitive camp. Moving up is a clearing in the woods where you set up a kitchen area, you set up a, uh, a sanitation area or bathroom area. Now the next level to that is wider access where you might bring in an RV or you might build larger cabins or you might build other things. But this clearing in the woods, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, we're in the Mid-Atlantic area, a region. You're going to want that clearing to be a north-south orientation. Now, why is that important? Well, we want that sun to keep that area dry. We want that sun to come through there and make it uh, give you longer hours during the day that you can see without having to use you know, lights or, or other outside stuff. We want the clearing to be large enough that it can support a bonfire or an open campfire. And that the tents could be far enough from that and the kitchen area could be far, far enough. We want to have access to it uh, that we can park our vehicles where we can see them if you're going to drive onto the site. Uh, if not, you're going to have a place where you can park your vehicle securely. Because you don't want to be out on a piece of land worrying about your, ve your vehicle. Uh, finally, this could be your potential home site. But as we're getting familiar with the land, it, it doesn't have to be. Because some of the mistakes people make is they get, they, they want the certain view. They want to be on top of a hill. They want to be um, near a river. And they don't understand the development of that land when it comes to proper placement. So if you're up on a hill, very often you're going to get a lot of heat. You're going to get odd winds. If you're at the bottom of the hill in a valley, you're going to get cold winds in the winter. Um, if you are not facing towards the sun, you're going to lose the, the benefit of that solar radiation that could warm and even help cool your house. Uh, so we want to, again, when we're starting out primitively, set your tent up where you think you might want your house. How does it look like when the sun's coming up in the morning? Uh, are the views as spectacular as you thought they would be? Do you have winds that you have to deal with? This gives you the minimal footprint on the land 
and the maximum value for your overall usage. And see, that's why I'm thinking about this goat project where we're going to we're going to uh, already going to do the goats in a rotation uh, about every week, moving the tent and moving the camp around the property as we're working on the property, as we're engaging with the with the the land and getting familiar with it, this would give us an opportunity to kind of see what's going on. Now, as you know, the property that we use as a demonstration site has already got trails, um, but there's the potential to do this onto other people's property if I was managing animals under contract for someone else's land. Um, but, you know, yes, it's a little bit of a gypsy or, or a migrant or a um, kind of a... I don't think those are negative connotations, by the way. Somebody who is nomadic, who is moving with the animals, is able to more carefully care for those animals, to be more responsive to the needs of those animals. It's part of, if I'm going to subject you to this environment, I'm going to also experience it as well. It's a symbiotic relationship between the two uh, that allows you to care for the animals while caring for the land. And so... um, if I use those terms and they bother you, understand I don't see them as negative terms. I see them as part of that experience with the land. One of the things about this business developer, uh, this land developer that I, I had a great opportunity to be a mentor, uh, he became my mentor, uh, is that he he saw that land as generational. So when they set up that family retreat, the family would come back year after year. Now, he didn't go out and buy that perfect property the first time. He bought a piece of property and he might have flipped it. A lot of cases, he found that the farmer could get much better use out of the land than he could. And there was no hope that it would ever be a development. And so he ended up selling the land to the farmer. And he'd take that money and he would invest it into the next piece of land. He was very good at cash flowing property, whether it was agricultural property, forestry land, or farmland, he eventually cash flowed the property in a lump sum by developing it or cash flowed it over time by having the land work a useful purpose. So what I'm trying to cultivate to you is what he taught me is about getting out there and interacting with the land and and understanding the land. So let's say you get a piece of property that you want to hunt on and you set up on your calendar at the beginning of every year one week that you're going to be out on that land. Maybe two weeks that you're going to be out on that land. And you just make that the thing that you're going to do. And you're going to get out there, engage with that land, understand the life, the, not the livestock, but the life of the land, the, uh, the wildlife of the land, and how you can enhance that land by habitat management. And so you cut trails to get out on the piece of property. Maybe at first you struggle through the, the underbrush or you, you look for historical roads and trails, but you, you start setting up little camps. And then you start getting that, what is the rotation that you do as you move through that property through different season? Where are the best bucks and deer on that property? Where are the quail in that property? Where are the turkey in that property? Where is the bear in that property? And you start just becoming connected with that land in a way that's not usually available to people when they're dreaming about this. Because when you're sitting in a comfortable home watching the latest YouTube video and you're just dreaming about one day you're going to be free, you're actually enslaving yourself because you're putting off the freedoms that are available right now. Put on that backpack, grab your bike, grab the minimal viable comforts. Now, I know some of you guys are old and you got CPAP machines like me and you don't want to be sleeping on the ground, uh, even though, by the way, sleeping on the ground the right way is often better for you than sleeping in a very cushy, soft mattress. But my point being is it can start with a foot trail. You foot trail out to a clearing in the woods. You set up your basic camp. You experience that land the way it is. And you say, well, you know what? Maybe next year we're going to build a little cabin. Maybe next year we're going to build a permanent pavilion. Because I like it when we're eating breakfast and that sun comes in the way it does. And it just livens us up. It connects us with the earth, the smells, the, the visions, uh, the the different nooks that you'll find on the property that, that really give you connection. Do this before you clear the trees. Get to know the land as it is. Now, some of this land is damaged. And so you might even just spend time out there cleaning up trash. You might spend time out there just identifying the challenges like erosion, 
uh, like areas that are overgrown that should be cleared. So I, I found on a piece of property, and you know I survey property for buyers, I found using satellites old roads. But when they get down on the land, they find the road hasn't been used in 15 or 20 years, and it's overgrown. But it doesn't take much to know that there's a road base under there. And because we can see it on the satellites, and because there's a road base, they can come out and just do the forestry mulching on that road. It's a safe and accessible way to get into the property, and it opens up. It makes it like a new piece of land. It just opens it up. So we're going to have that clearing in the woods. We're going to orient our camp north-south if you're in the northern hemisphere. We're going to hike in our original equipment. Maybe it's a a little dome tent and a a tarp that goes up. Um, Maybe it's waterproof totes. Maybe as the land gets more clear, you might use an all-terrain vehicle or a utility vehicle to haul out a trailer. You might put storage on site when you find a good camp that, that works for you. Lock it all up. You might have a map of the the where the animals are traveling so you're going to make sure your camp is away from that and then you're going to be able to be there at the season when the very best most healthy healthy animals are there maybe you're going to install deer plots or other types of feed plots maybe you're going to restore pasture land or other types of meadow habitat the key is do something turn off the youtube or take it with you if you have to but go On the land, if you own a piece of land and you're an absentee owner, you've never seen the land, you've never been to the land, maybe you've inherited a piece of land, either do something with it or pass it along. Do something with it by at least getting out there and hiking or or enjoying it as a family, stewarding that land, making sure we're improving that land. Some people go out and trash the land. I I just have to say that. I, I don't understand why they do it, but they do it. They'll race their ATVs all over the place. They'll make new trails where there shouldn't be trails. They'll go mud bogging. That's unfortunate. Uh, I tend to to lean towards uh, conservation versus uh, corrupting the land. Um, But again, get out there and check it out. Spend a weekend. Spend a few hours. As you start discovering the land and and the, the potential for it, rather than dreaming, what is the minimal viable implementation? So last year you went out and you just primitive camped. This year you're going to go out, build a pavilion, and have a a different style of camping. There's nothing wrong with taking your your RV out there or or van camping or camping out of the back of a truck or setting up a camp trailer. These are outdoor lifestyle things that enhance your ability to use the land. They increase your quality of life. They improve your health. And they help you start understanding how the land works. What direction is the wind coming from? Where does the sun come up? Uh, How does the terrain work? What are good growing areas? What are not? Now, I'm going to leave you the last benefit here. Because I did mention if you're not going to use the land, if it's not a perfect land for you, sell it it along. There is value in getting out there and experiencing the land. And if you find out that land's not for you, you haven't built any permanent structures. You haven't paid for power. You haven't got water lines put out there. You didn't install a well. You just got out there to experience the land and you can go on and find that better piece of land. See, we don't want to get stuck with something that we don't like. We don't want to, uh, you know, turn it into a zoo because you, you, you didn't understand what animals would be good and what animals wouldn't be good. You didn't understand where to put the house and now you're paying extra in utility bills because the house is in the wrong location. Again, This helps you develop your design plan. It helps you understand the land more appropriately and ultimately produce a prosperous homestead. I'm Justin Hitt with Prosperity Homestead. You can visit us at www.prosperityhomestead.org. We've got a number of free resources for our members and for our visitors to ask questions, to engage in planning, and to ultimately get the most from your land. Thanks for listening.